Hello everyone, my name is James Cook with the University of Washington in Seattle. Today I want to talk to you about the rotating detonation engine, or more specifically, the nonlinear dynamics of the waves we see inside of these engines. The work I'm going to be showing here was featured in uh, two articles. Uh, first is Physical Review E uh, by Cook, Kurosaka, uh, Nolan, and Kutz. And then the second uh, we posted to the archive. Uh, it's going to be submitted uh, sometime soon. So you might ask, what is the RDE exactly? Now, to properly motivate this, I want to show first the historical context. So this here is a picture of the F1 rocket injector plate. And you might notice that there are a lot of very interesting features all around the engine. So we can see here uh, baffles uh, line the engine circumferentially. We also have baffles uh, that prevent maybe some uh, radial motion here. And that's exactly the motivation for uh, these structures. So these are baffles to prevent the formation of thermoacoustic instabilities associated with the heat release process for this periodic geometry. So we have, for example here, baffles perpendicular to the first circumferential mode of oscillation and also against the radial mode uh, of acoustic uh, propagation. Now, around the same time as engineers were developing this engine, uh, there was a, uh, another effort to perhaps simplify the, uh, the methodology used to uh, mitigate thermoacoustic instabilities. So engineers proposed a an alternative. And this alternative was perversely not to mitigate these thermoacoustic instabilities, but actually to saturate them such that they quickly transition to um, perhaps stable structures or predictable behavior. So the easiest way one can do this is actually to remove the baffles and actually isolate one of the uh, acoustic modes uh, such that we promote its uh, as amplification. So this here is uh, the same injector face, but I've overlaid just this circle to show you what uh, amplifying the first tangential mode might look like, right? So in the limit, what we can expect is that these circumferential instabilities might transition to a number of traveling detonation waves. Right, so this is pretty special. I've shown here a sketch of the rotating detonation engine flow field. Uh, starting from over here, we have um, some discrete fuel and oxidizer injection ports. They go into the annular combustion chamber. And then we also have the detonation wave itself right here, right? Um, but what's interesting is that it's actually this dichotomy of time scales that gives rise to this stable flow field structure. We have the detonation time scale, which is incredibly short, uh, both in space and time. Uh, that really, really fast time scale of combustion is what drives the wave motion forward uh, as per detonation theory, classical detonation theory. We have another time scale prescribed by the time it takes for the detonation wave to circumnavigate our entire annulus. And likewise, within that one period, we have to have sufficient fuel reintroduction and mixing for the detonation wave to stably propagate. That little uh, period of, of mixing and reintroduction of fuel is shown here in this sliver of this olive colored uh, region here. So that represents the regeneration of propellant for the detonation wave to propagate through. Now, one of the nice things is that uh, because this is an annular combustion chamber with no moving parts, it's remarkably easy to make and test in a laboratory setting. So what I've shown here are two images. This is um, the University of Washington's three-inch RDE. This is the engine that I designed and, uh, and tested for my doctoral work here. I've shown in the upper right-hand corner, this is an isometric view of the CAD. And the bottom image is if I were to take a section cut of that uh, top image down the axis to show you the internals. So a couple of features here to note. Uh, my propellant enters here and mixes uh, after introduction through these orifices in this combustion chamber, right? So after mixing, a detonation wave can 
come on by, uh, ingest that propellant, and ex um, uh, expand the hot gases downstream, which is going to produce uh, thrust in this case. One of the other nice things is that we can directly image our combustion chamber during experiments, which give us remarkable uh, images like this. So this is an ignition phenomena that I filmed in one of our experiments. So after this nice deflagration plume, we see the rapid transition to detonation waves that wrap around the annulus. We have this nice flame out consuming the uh, leftover propellant uh, downstream of the combustor. And now we see the stable formation, uh, or the, rather the formation of, of stable pulses um, through time after this flame out. So right now I see three waves uh, who through time are mode locking. They're approaching the same stable speed and same phase difference between the different waves. Now instead of watching videos, which is entertaining in its own right, what we can do is uh, perhaps recast the videos in terms of just a series or snapshots of the system. So what I can do is take every video frame and I can find the location of the annulus for each video frame and I can integrate the pixel intensity around that annulus. So I'm going to get this nice column vector representing uh, the state of the domain for that uh, uh, point in time. Now what I can do is I can stack those 1D vectors up into a 2D array and display that as a simple uh, pseudocolor plot or as an image, which is shown here in the bottom right. Uh, so this is actual data of an experiment that exhibited uh, one wave that was stably propagating uh, in space and in time. So what I'd like to do now is uh, show you all some examples of wave transients. I'll start before playing this video and showing you what the XT uh, or X theta, sorry, theta T diagrams look like. Uh, and the top figure here, I have the raw pixel intensity through time. So again, if I were to take a vertical cut, that vertical cut is going to show uh, uh, through the entire 2 pi of the annulus, uh, the integrated pixel intensity. The bottom is instead of in the laboratory reference frame, so instead of what the camera is seeing, I am now going to attach myself to one of the detonation ways. I'm going to look uh, forward through the annulus until I reach my own tail, right? So in this way, I am not in the laboratory reference frame. I am in the reference frame of the detonation wave. And in this reference frame, uh, my phase difference between the different waves uh, now is an explicit output. So let's play this video. Right now I have a single detonation wave and it appears to be um, traveling around the, the annulus. I don't know if it's stable or unstable yet. I, I don't know the speed. Uh, but I want you to, to pay attention to what's happening in other parts of the annulus. We might start to see some background luminosity changes uh, reflecting uh, different regions of combustion in different portions. So you might notice that as I, as I move along, at some point in criticality, I'm going to form a second detonation wave, or rather a second luminous blob. Um, because of the nature of the annulus, I, I have some really tight channels and geometric confinement. I'm going to promote the self-steepening of pressure and density gradients. It's eventually going to lead to shock formation. And as soon as that shock forms, I'm going to have coupling of of the shock front and heat release that's going to, to transition to another detonation wave. That's exactly what's happening in the video and around these points in time. Um, and through time, these different waves uh, uh, approach, again, a nice uh, stable phase difference between them. Uh, that's a phase difference of pi radians or 180 degrees. Now I can show you uh, another similar video going from instead of one to two waves, how about from two to one wave? Uh, so it's the same style of plot. I have raw pixel intensity, and then I have in the wave reference frame uh, through time. What's really nice about this is you can see a really, really clear and explicit exchange of wave strength, amplitude, speed, uh, and their phase difference, or the, the difference in, um, in phase between the waves is also oscillatory. Uh, and seemingly growing exponentially in time until eventually another point of criticality occurs where there's a destructive bifurcation. The stronger of the two waves during one of the large amplitude modulations actually overruns the weaker wave. Uh, this is the transition from two to one. So we can let this video play. I see that they are dancing around each other. Uh, 
you know, the phase difference go, goes from less than pi to greater than pi. Uh, really an interesting process. Now, now I can see that the waves are beginning to have even further a large amplitude modulation. So one of these, we will see the larger wave overrun the weaker. Yeah, there it is now. It's just a fantastic process. Now lastly, I've shown wave destruction. I've shown wave nucleation. But there's also an opportunity for uh, what appears to be almost like simple harmonic motion, right? If you were to think of just a, a, a simple oscillator. Now, these are two waves playing this cat and mouse game inside of our chamber where one accelerates, the other one catches up, the preceding wave catches up to the tail of the other wave. They just keep going in this interesting cycle. Now, I've shown here the same two style of plots, a laboratory reference frame and in the reference frame of one of the waves. And you can see this really large amplitude modulation of uh, phase difference, uh, but it does appear to be stable in time, right? So what I would like to do now is uh, I have a collection of, of nonlinear dynamics. I have a collection of bifurcations of the system. I would like to formulate a model to capture these phenomena. So what, I, what I'm going to do is um, just a really simple control volume approach, and I really hope that I can, I can recover things like a, a detonation-like structure. So those of you who are more familiar with detonation community or the detonation literature, this would be like the Zeldovich von Neumann Doring uh, model for, for detonation. I also want the interaction of time scales. I mentioned before that there's a dichotomy of scales between injection, the round trip time of the wave, the time scale of combustion. Uh, I do want a model to appropriately um, uh, watch or observe the interplay of these different time scales. So to get started, I'm going to show a really simple 2D control volume. Uh, a couple of things to note here. This is, this is my model, so I get to choose the fluid, right? So you might notice that I have flux functions, uh, but these flux functions are up to me to determine uh, uh, their functional form, right? So let's start by looking at what I'm actually tracking. So I'm going to do the, uh, um, the evolution of uh, an intensive fluid property. Um, perhaps analogous to internal energy, which I'll denote by uh, lowercase u. Now, I also know that my reaction waves are uh, supported by energy input from combustion, right? So I'm also going to have a source term somewhere in my model that's going to mimic chemical heat release uh, Q um, via the progression of a combustion progress variable, which I'm going to denote as lambda, right? Now, in my model, I'm free to choose my flux function, uh, I'm going to choose Berger's flux. So Berger's flux is 1 half u squared. What's nice about Berger's flux is that it's uh, mathematically pretty tractable, right? But also, Berger's flux guarantees that I will have shock formation with any concavity change in my domain, right? So if I have Berger's flux and I correctly incorporate a source term, I can, I can begin to have a model that might uh, 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 that might have the interplay of chemistry and flow, which is what I want. I want that detonation structure. You might also notice that I have here one half, one half u squared is equal to p. So p is indeed pressure, um, just by analogy here. And that's because I want to enforce that the gradient of my flux function uh, is what drives the flow, right? So it's a pressure gradient that drives the flow, and I need to be consistent with my, my fluid analogy for this model. So if I do the standard control volume approach, and I take the limits uh, as, my, as my control volume dimensions go to zero, right, in both x and y space, spatial dimensions, I get something that looks like this, right? So I have the temporal evolution of my internal energy uh, property, with my spatial derivative terms is equal to my source term, uh, the, or the heat release. My x direction is going to be my periodic dimension. This is going to be my 1D domain uh, about the circumferential uh, uh, dimension of my annulus. My uh, axial gradient, so that's my uh, partial u squared over 2, partial y, I am going to model this. So this is my like an axial pressure gradient that's going to be modeled. And you might notice that I have here um, this minus epsilon u squared. So the reason this is a, a, 
this simplifies to a polynomial is that uh, in our lab, we actually observe that if you pump enough energy into this a small annular chamber, it's actually pretty easy to thermally choke the device. And it turns out that thermally choked devices or back pressurized devices have self-similar combustor profiles uh, in terms of static pressure. So I'm enforcing the same behavior via this uh, really simple quadratic loss term. Now lastly, we need to talk about the uh, dynamics of my combustion progress variable. Now, uh, in my previous source term, I just had uh, this partial lambda partial T um, modifying my, my heat release little Q, but that's not sufficient. I need to, to introduce a competition between injection and uh, combustion, right? They go head to head. I also need to introduce the competition between uh, energy input and energy output. So what this ends up looking like is I have uh, gain depletion by combustion. That's what this term represents. This is uh, similar to Arrhenius kinetics. And I have gain recovery, where gain recovery is an injection model, right? So this is how I'm introducing the chemical potential into my domain. Likewise, for the evolution of, of little u, I have input-output uh, energy balance, right? So all my energy is input through uh, chemical reactions, and my energy is dissipated uh, through, uh, ex in this case, exhaust. But what's nice about this is it's an input-output energy balance, but with a nonlinear medium, right? This Burgers flux that's going to give us shock formation. Now, the last piece to put this all together is an injection model. So I call this like a zero-order injection model. In our experiments, we use uh, gaseous propellants with choked orifices. What I mean by that is we have a really, really high pressure ratio uh, between upstream of the orifice or the gas injector and downstream, which would be the combustion chamber. But as these detonation waves pass over our orifice locations, the detonation wave is a really, really high pressure. So it turns out that the detonation wave imposes a blockage, or even worse, a backflow uh, of propellant back into our propellant feed system. So I've defined here uh, this beta. This is uh, an injection, excuse me, an injection model that's based on an activation function. So you can imagine I have, I have the state of my domain, little u, uh, that's acting as an on-off switch um, uh, imposed on the injection scheme. So if the state of my combustors is a uh, high energy, a high u, I can't flow any more propellant into the domain. So that's what this activation function is mimicking. Um, I have a time constant defined here as uh, little s times u sub p, where u sub p is this threshold for uh, um, injection or no injection. So I'm directly modifying an injection time constant, and then I'm normalizing this by um, an, an activation-like term, where eventually, if my domain is high enough, I can no longer inject um, a propellant. So what do you guys say that we start to get into some numerical experiments? Um, I'm going to show you guys one of the first runs I did. Uh, so this is a simulation output. Uh, that I can just display much in the same way that we saw the videos. Uh, so after an initial pulse, uh, I see some uh, really interesting uh, transient dynamics at the beginning of the simulation, though eventually through time, I have two waves that approach the same stable speed and phase differences. They become mode locked. So it's very, very exciting and promising results. I can show, much like I did in the experiments, I can show the same style of theta through time diagrams showing the space-time history. And I've shown here a couple of different snapshots at different points in time. So this is my initial condition, just a, a really nice uh, set pulse to start off the reactions. And then I have an immediate transition, excuse me, immediate transition to um, a detonation wave, a chaplin Huguet uh, detonation wave. You can see a really, really a sharp peaked uh, spike in the state of my domain uh, and a really nice decaying tail afterwards. Now, as soon as this detonation wave reaches its tail, there has not been enough propellant reintroduction to sustain that high speed and high strength. So what you see is that the detonation wave uh, immediately starts to decay, but then also because now the detonation wave has decayed and has slowed down, the deflagration or the slow scale combustion that's not associated with the wave, deflagration actually starts to play an important role. 
So you see the deflagration in the domains start to self-steepen and form a second detonation wave because the other wave in the, in the chamber was not strong enough um, uh, to prevent that from happening. So a really interesting interplay of, of time scales that we're already starting to see in this model. What's really cool is that uh, I can recover a lot of the same dynamics that we saw in experiments. Here's wave nucleation. It's the same video that I showed before. And I can show you uh, the same style of wave nucleation uh, just from the prior slide. It's that same data just showing you in terms of the wave reference frame instead of in the laboratory reference frame. So immediately after nucleation of a second wave, we see the phase difference oscillations approach pi, right, pi radians, uh, and we have stably mode-locked uh, pulses. In the bottom, I, I have here uh, uh, this fraction D over DCJ. This corresponds to um, the fraction of wave speed uh, related to uh, the Chapman gaze speed. So this is, this is essentially saying that uh, prior to wave nucleation, I have a certain speed, call it around 75% of the Chapman gaze speed, but after wave nucleation, my speeds decrease in both experiments in the model by about 10%. I can show you the same thing for uh, wave destruction. Again, this is my experiment. I can show the same thing for uh, uh, um, a similar or representative case from the simulation. And again, I have uh, my wave speeds through time. Really encouraging stuff. So lastly, you might ask, well, what can I do with such a model? The possibilities are really endless, and this is a fantastic first step to looking into the future of uh, stability analysis, um, control, different actuation schemes might be able to be conceptualized and introduced in such a model. So uh, as an example, this is, um, this is a, a sub-study I did of a bifurcation analysis showing what could happen with uh, steadily propagating um, uh, detonation waves. This is an experiment shown in the mean velocity reference frame through time, non-dimensional time, showing this characteristic exchange of wave strength, amplitude, phase difference, and speed, right? So a fantastic repeatable structure here. Now, just by doing a bifurcation style analysis, I can extract a qualitatively identical uh, repeatable kinematic trace showing qualitatively the same features, right? But what's even better is that through such a model and through such an analysis, I know the route it takes to get to this specific condition, which is a huge first step. So in terms of uh, wave stability or wave uh, dynamics through a set of, uh, of engineering parameters, we now have um, what I would call the first step um, uh, to producing or reproducing these dynamics. So lastly, I do wanna go back and recognize that um, these works and these figures are featured in these two papers. Uh, they can be found in the video description. Um, and uh, if, there's, uh, uh, if there's anything else or any other questions you might have, you're free to email me. Um, my email address is found uh, attached to these two papers as well. Thank you so much.